who in order to be saved on top of Jesus. And um, I just want to encourage you this. Um, the commentary was enduring word commentary said this. The fact that Jesus has made us, um, the fact is that Jesus has made us free. If we live in bondage to a legal relationship with God, it isn't because God wills it. God pleads with us to take his strength and to walk in that freedom and to not be entangled again by the yoke of bondage. Um, and that's what I want to encourage us this morning. You know, as much as, as much as I might enjoy your singing, we're not going to pay our way to heaven or make things right with God by our singing. Um, by studying his word for the heck of it is not going to appease us with God and make the sin problem go away. It's only Jesus Christ. We have to put our full weight and trust in him that even if I have a bad day or a great day, that he paid for it all on the cross. Because of that, I walk in freedom. I don't have to live in fear that I'm separated from God. He's secured it. He's paid my debt. He's paid your debt. And that's what we remember this morning. Amen? So as we continue on, I want us to remember what he's done for us and celebrate the freedom that we don't have to Although he calls us to do good works, he calls us to, do, to live in righteousness, that it's not dependent on my actions for my salvation. And I'm grateful for that. Amen? All right. Let's pray real quick as we continue. God, I'm asking that you would, um, I'm asking that you would just help us to, to understand that, that we can't pay our way into good graces with you. Um, Lord, it was only one payment that would even, that would cut the bill, or that would be, um, satiating to your, to your justice and your wrath, and that's Jesus taking our place, being the perfect sacrifice. Lord, I pray that we would have no righteousness on our own coming to you. We would understand that without you, we have nothing, nothing to give you, nothing to wow you or for you to say, well done. It's all because of the work of Jesus, and uh, I pray that we would take that to heart and that we would understand that truth, help us to understand that truth, and worship out of it, worship out of a freedom, knowing what Jesus has done for us. So, Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
for the cross. We thank you for everything that you've done for us. And again, Lord, out of a heart of gratitude and thankfulness, would you help us to worship you? It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do. But every song must end and you never do. So I throw my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a
Psalm 121 says, I lift up my eyes to the mountain. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He watches over you. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your comings and your goings, both now and forever. Please bow your heads and pray. Oh Lord, what an honor it is to serve you. How mighty you are. Your love is overflowing. And Lord, you watch over us vigilantly, like a, a parent with a newborn. We're just so unworthy, Lord, yet you won't let us fall. Today, God, as we gather here today, we want to honor you with our lips. We want to worship you, Lord God. And we just pray, Lord, that this song is worthy of your ears, Lord, that it is pleasing to you, Lord. And we just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good afternoon, church. This is New Life Community Church Norwich. I want to welcome you all here today on a beautiful, beautiful Sunday afternoon. Uh, before you take a seat, please turn around. Greet somebody new. Find somebody you haven't met before. Learn their name. Jack? How you doing, brother? Good, man. And as you guys take your seats, um, for those that are brand new here, first time, maybe second time coming, we want to give you an especially warm welcome. 
New Life Community Church loves visitors. We love new, new people, and we just want to welcome you with um, open hearts. And uh, if you wouldn't mind, just take a moment um, to fill out. There's a green and white card that's in the pew back in front of you. And if you could just fill that out, this is just a way for us to get in contact with you, to share with you all that goes on here at New Life. Also, um, so that uh, we can give you guys the, uh, the pastor notes, which we send out weekly. Uh, and for filling that out, we'd like to give you a free gift. So if you fill that out and give it to one of the ushers in the back when you leave, uh, we'd like to give you a free gift for saying thank you for joining us. And we hope to see you again soon. Okay, by uh, way of announcements, we got a few things to share. Number one, normally we would do our uh, monthly worship and prayer service the first Monday of the month, but being that tomorrow is a holiday, uh, we are going to extend it a week. So we're going to be meeting uh, here on Monday the 11th. Uh, that'll be uh, in the evening. Um, so just plan on joining us for a, a powerful time of um, worship and prayer that night. So not tomorrow, but next Monday the 11th. Also, uh, we do have a uh, one youth event coming up uh, this coming Saturday at July 9th from 10 a.m. to noon, that'll be in the basement. Uh, we're calling it Cartoon Saturday. Uh, so for those that are in 7th to 11th grades, please come and bring your favorite cereal. <laughs> uh, and that'll be from 10 a.m. To, uh, to noon. Okay, uh, and then finally, guys, we just want to thank all those that came out for the Bible Club this week. Amen? I think we got some pictures to show. Um, but it was just uh, an awesome time for, for the little ones to uh, uh, just come, you know, just during the week, obviously, there. I know some of you parents, I know, I know we're kind of in that boat, you know, summer's been out for a few weeks, and kids are starting to get restless. We've done all the, the summer must-dos, right? Um, so it was good to kind of get them back into some kind of structured learning, uh, albeit for, uh, for about an hour and a half, but it was, it was a great time for them. And then... Um, yeah, this is just beautiful. We had some visitors come too, just people from the neighborhood or some people, some kids invited their friends out and it was just an awesome way uh, to minister to each one of them. So uh, thank you to all the, the kids that came out and also to the parents uh, for bringing them uh, during this past week. All right, and now we'll move on to, uh, to our, our giving. Um, if you are gonna be tithing or uh, giving an offering this morning, uh, there is a, an envelope in the pew back uh, you can use that to, uh, to give. If you're going to write a check, just make it payable to New Life Community Church and write an orange in the memo. And then obviously, uh, giving online is always an easy and, and a efficient option. So uh, consider doing that as well. We'll, uh, we'll pray, but first I want to read from Hebrews 13, uh, which says, Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, for... By doing so, doing some people have uh, shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. So, God, we just want to pray, Lord, for this offering, Lord. And uh, just as we're, we're reading in Hebrews, Lord God, just, we just don't know the impact that um, uh, what you have called us to do has sometimes, Lord God. But um, certainly, Lord God, you have called us to, to give, to give cheerfully, Lord God. And that's a way that we can um, pour back into your kingdom, Lord God. So, Lord, we just pray for this offering. We pray, Lord God, that it would be used mightily, uh, that it would be exponentially um, blessing to other people, Lord God, in our community, in our church, and those beyond, Father God. So we, we pray these things, Lord God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Hey, New Life. Did you know that 80%...
Hey, can I tell you something? Uh, let's, I want to give it up for two things. Uh, I want to give it up, first of all, for George. Where is George at with his handsome haircut? For uh, coming in last week and stepping in and uh, taking, taking the, the, the place of lead, of lead teaching. It's not easy to do that. He put a lot of effort into it. He's a very serious man. He's a man full of integrity, and he's a good shepherd. He's a good shepherd. So I want to give him thanks. Second, I want to give thanks to the entire tech team and the worship team. Um, there's a lot of things. I am technically unsophisticated. So, uh, you know, I make it hard on them. So uh, I cause them to have to do things uh, at a last minute, and it doesn't always work out because technology is kind of funny that way. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you guys for all your effort. Okay. Let's open up our Bibles. I'm grateful to be back, by the way. I'm happy to be here. Um, let's open up our Bibles to uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, um, starting at verse 1. It starts with the word but, which means, well, we know what but means. Um, it, it actually starts in verse 12 of the previous chapter, but we're not going to read that because we already read that. He's talking about the, the testimony of Scripture. And he's talking about the trustworthiness of Scripture. So we're going to go from verse 1 in chapter 2 to the very end of the chapter together, okay? But let's pray because uh, we need to pray. Father God, I just want to say thanks. Thanks for um, uh, just the constant care. First of all, Lord God, I, I, I thank you for the fact that you are regularly, constantly teaching. You know, some of the stuff that you do in my heart and in my mind, I'm not even aware you're doing it. It's like, I'm kind of like, sometimes I'm floating around and things are floating over my head. And Lord God, this stuff catches. And at the most obscure times, in the most obscure ways, I see the evidence that it's taken root in my heart. And I know that that's the way that you, you perfect your church, your saints. And I'm asking you to protect us. Protect us from hearing wrongly, speaking wrongly. I pray that when we hear truth, that it would not just cause pain, but it would be a healing. There would be something that would cause a healing inside of us because ultimately, Lord God, we are broken by a a flawed and warped heart and partially because we like it. There's something in our flesh that likes brokenness. And I pray, Lord God, that uh, you would change us, change us from the inside to the outside. And I pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Paul, Peter speaking, he says, but there were also false prophets amongst the people back then, just as there will be false teachers amongst you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you and fabricate stories. Their condemnation has been long hanging over them. That's a scary statement. I would love to teach it uh, or proclaim it uh, to a lot of people because... A lot of people are in a lot of trouble. You know, when, you, when you're using it, when you're coming before here, this is a solemn office, and when you open up the word of God to, to deliberately or even ignorantly distort it is a dangerous, dangerous thing. Okay. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you. They'll fabricate stories. Their condemnation has been long hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. That means it's coming for them with a the determination. Coming with a determination. For if God did not spare his own angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, he, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood upon ungodly people, but protected Noah, the preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them examples of what's going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man, eh, who was distressed by the depraved conduct of the lawless, for a righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds of what he saw and he heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to, listen, rescue the godly from trials and hold the unrighteous for judgment on the day of judgment. 
Did you hear that? Okay. This is especially true of those who follow corrupt desires of the flesh and despise authority. Bold and arrogant, they're not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings, not even angels. Though, th uh, although they are stronger and more powerful, they do not heap such abuse on beings when bringing judgment on them from the Lord. But I, uh, uh, but the Lord, but these people blaspheme in manners they do not understand. They are like unreasoning animals, created creatures of instinct, brought born to be caught and destroyed. They are animals, just like animals, they too will perish. They will be paid back with harm for the harm that they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylights. They are blots and blemishes revealing their pleasures while they feast with you. Their eyes are full of adultery, never stop sinning. They never stop seducing. They are unstable. They are experts in greed and a cursed brood. They have left the straight way, wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bezar, who loved the wages of wickedness, but he rebuked, he was rebuked for his long do, wrongdoing by a donkey, an animal without speech, who spoke with a human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. Wow, that's amazing. These people are springs without water. They are mists driven by the storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them, for their mouth is empty, and they have boastful words. And by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in such error. They promise them freedom while they themselves live as slaves of depravity, for people are slaves to whatever masters them. Amen. If they have escaped the correction, if they have escaped the correction by knowing the word of our Lord, knowing the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and are again entangled in it, they are overcome. They are far worse. Listen to this. They are far worse at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than to know it and turn their backs on it. <sighs> of them, the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. Man, those are sobering words. Um... I did, I've been doing a lot of uh, introspection lately. I've been doing a lot of uh, inventory uh, for the past several uh, weeks. And um, I realized that when I started this three and a half years ago, there were things that I saw on a regular basis in the church that I loved that uh, kind of bugged me. It bugged me. I didn't, I felt like there was things that were being omitted. There were things that were important that were robbing God of glory by changed lives. They would promote things that were marketable and encouraging and uplifting while somehow skirting around uncomfortable things. So when I came here, many of you can attest, I came with a little bit of a chip on my shoulder. Is it, you know what I'm talking about? And uh, I realized, even though I was telling the truth, I have to apologize to you. Uh, because even though I was saying the truth, I came with bad motives. And that's not being a good shepherd. And for that, I apologize. And for that, I, uh, I am determined to change through prayer and through submission. I'm going to always tell you the truth, but I'm not going to tell it anymore in an in-your-face sort of way. I'm going to say it in a very humble and uh, sad sort of way because the truth has implications. It really does. And uh, I don't know if I can somehow stand on a higher platform or even sound like um, I have it figured out better than anybody else because I don't. I don't. So, uh, you know, I'm determined to change, and I encourage you to, to, to seek after change because that's what grace offers us. It offers us the ability to change. It offers us the ability to look at things that we wouldn't naturally be um, agreeable to pay attention to or look at or examine. Okay, let's go to this scripture. Peter, Paul, and John are all the same. They are at the forefront of a spiritual invasion. It says in Colossians, the book of Colossians, that when Jesus rose from the dead, he stripped the enemy of considerable weaponry. There's weapons that the angels and the angelic armies have that are useful in deceiving, um, 
I know this is kind of crazy for people to believe, but heavily influencing to the point of possessing those who are unsaved. But for those who are saved, who are brought into the kingdom, who are purchased by the Holy Spirit, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, they cannot work on us anymore. But he still has one weapon that has never been taken away from him. And you know what that is? It's deception. He's a good liar. Has anybody ever known a good liar? Oh, I have. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. I was a good liar. I was so good I could convince myself of my lies. That's when you know you're really a good liar. Well, the, 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 devil, the, the devil is an, is a liar. That is his native language, as Jesus says. And one thing we can all agree with is that lies are dangerous. And because they are dangerous, we're going to look at false teachers for two weeks Because I believe we are entering into the last times. Not the as in the only, but the as in a particular last times. I believe God is taking us from one period to another period. I do not know what that means. I do not mean that Jesus is going to break through the clouds at 12 o'clock midnight with a trumpet. He could, but that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that he's ending one work and one era, and he's starting a new one. And from what I see, I believe many false teachers are going to rise up at this time. There's many already here. And I also believe that God is going to raise up true teachers, true teachers. I believe that God is going to be collecting his elect. So it's important for us, I think, to understand the methods of, le- uh, of deception. First thing, outright lies. Outright lies are a great way to deceive anyone. You just spew garbage. You know, you make it up, and the more appealing it sounds, the more... I like to say this. Uh, Satan, is, 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 he's got the easiest job in the world because he's selling things to people who want to buy what he's selling. I don't know about you, but everything he tempts me with is something that my flesh hungers for on a regular basis. But by the spirit, I say no to. And you know what he tries to convince me? He tries to convince me, you deserve it and you can afford it. That's what he tries to convince me. He's got the easiest job on earth. So outright lies are one of the ways of deceiving people. I'm not going to mention names. I'm tempted to but I'm not going to because I want the Holy Spirit to work within each of you to get you to discern who's a liar and who's not. But I would bet that there are people here that regularly listen to teachers who cloak themselves in white, the white robes of Christianity that are outright liars. There is an entire TV station that is full of outright liars. Outright liars. They're deceiving people and they're leading them to destruction. Second way, partial truth, partial lie mixture. That's probably the most easy way to deceive someone. You just kind of tell them the truth and you mix a little lie in it. And you think to yourself, well, what's the big deal? Well, let me explain something to you. If I'm making you a cake or I'm making you cookies and I use 99% of good ingredients, but I use one piece of my dog's poop, would you eat the cookie? Come on, it's 99% good. Right? No, 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 you wouldn't do it because a tiny bit mixes through the entire batch. So you got to remember that. Got to remember that. Third, omission of key aspects of truth. If I tell you all the ingredients on how to make this cake, but I do not tell you that you need to cook it for an hour and 45 minutes at 350 degrees or 400 degrees, you're going to have a failed meal. Am I correct? There are certain things that are in uh, uh, non-negotiable. You can't change them. You can't leave them out. They're necessary for the whole picture. Third, a distortion of the full picture. If I tell someone something about God, but I accentuate these parts that I feel make me comfortable, I can mislead you very badly about who God is. All right, listen, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about the genuineness of saving faith, genuineness of saving faith. There are three aspects of saving faith that must, M-U-S-T, meaning have to be, they have to be present for our faith to be a saving faith because there's other things that get passed off as faith. First, there's a general faith. I meet a lot of people 
who are uh, in just up to optimistic. I remember I had gone to this, uh, it was a long time ago, I was an elder, and this man had a heart attack, and someone within the church was related to this man, and I went out there, and I, I ministered to the family, and the brother was like, I believe, man, I have belief. And I, as I questioned him, I'm like, what, what do you have belief in? He just had a genuine and and overwhelming or overarching belief that things were going to work out for the good. And I sadly wasn't the right place to say it. I'm like, man, I don't know if that's really the smartest faith to have because some people will end up in a place they don't want to be. And that's not me. That's the scripture. The scripture's telling me this stuff. So it's important to, to understand that there are different kinds. There are also temporal faith. Well, I prayed to God one time, and God answered my prayer. God answers a lot of people's prayers. I've prayed to him a thousand times about a thousand different things, and he's answered some of them, and he said no to others. This is, once again, not a saving faith. It is a faith, but not a saving faith. So... Let's look at the three parts of it. These are high words, intelligent words. You guys are going to be a very educated and intelligent people. Not to puff your head up, but um, here. The first is this, notitia, N-O-T-I-T-I-A. That means there is a content of our faith. There are certain informational aspects of our faith that are non-negotiable. They are called core aspects of our faith. You cannot mess with core op, uh, uh, aspects of our faith because to do so, what you'll create is a bridge that is unstable and you cannot stand on it. You have removed the Jesus who has revealed himself and replaced him with a false Jesus or an antichrist. That Christ cannot save you. He simply cannot. That is not a saving faith. So there must be a, a body of evidence. For instance, I give you this. Jesus is God. Some people say, Jesus isn't God. No, no, no. Jesus is God, and he claimed to be God more than eight times. More than eight times. Implicitly. And there were other times where he explicit, uh, explicitly, implicitly, and non-implicitly. Uh, no, no, no. Let me explain. I don't got that wrong. Explicitly. He explicitly said, I am God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the gate. I am the water. I am the bread. And then he said, before Abraham was, I am. That's an explicit claim. I'm God. You must believe that Jesus Christ is God. And then there's implicit uh, 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 applications where people worshiped him in God and he received it. What we see in the book of Revelation is John, the apostle, sees an angel and he's so overwhelmed by the view of the angel, he gets down immediately and starts worshiping. And the angel's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't, don't do that. I'm, I'm not God. I'm just like you. I'm a messenger. So only God is ordained to receive worship and he received worship. Okay, so Jesus is God. Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are our only means for salvation. It's not Jesus and us. It's not Jesus and work. It's Jesus and him alone. But through Jesus Christ, what we see is the work somehow gets worked in us. It's God who works to live and to act according to our God his good purposes within us. So he's doing something inside of me to motivate my hands and my feet to act in accordance with what he desires. So it's Jesus who does it from beginning to end. That's why we sing praises to him. Because even in our imperfection, we are confident that he has saved us, we are secure in where he has placed us, but we are also striving for higher ground. We are striving for growth, okay? Here's another one. We must be born again of the Holy Spirit, John 3, 3. It doesn't matter if you were born into a Christian house. It doesn't matter if you proclaimed or said some prayer. Unless the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, you are not saved. You can ask, please give me your Holy Spirit. I long to be born of the Spirit. Third, Jesus must be portrayed to us as 100% God and 100% man all the time. He is for us sinless, perfect, and divine. These are core elements. You can't mess with that, okay? Second part, a census, which is a deep inner conviction that the content of our faith is true. 
Perfect example, Acts chapter 2. Peter, led by the Holy Spirit, goes out and talks to religious people. They're at a place called the, Pente- uh, the Pentecost. This is a, it's the Feast of the Booths. And he's talking to probably 5,000 people, maybe 10,000 people. And at first, he's talking, and everyone's kind of talking in different languages, and the crowd thinks they're drunk, and they're making fun of them. And then Peter steps up, and he gives them a, a, a sermon that literally at the end cuts them to the heart. And one of the aspects is, this Jesus whom died was killed by you. You put him to death. Now, if I'm in that crowd, I don't know about you, I'd be thinking to myself, what are you talking about? I didn't do anything to Jesus. I'm here for the weekend. Don't blame me for this guy's death. But the crowd, 5,000 within the crowd, felt the conviction that they somehow played a role in Christ's death. He explained to them that it was their sin that he came to die for. And what did they do? There was fruit and evidence. After they were cut to the heart, they said, what must we do? What must we do? Well, repent. Stop trusting in yourself. Stop trusting in religion. Stop trusting in your efforts. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Confess that you need him. Follow him from this day forward as your salvation and as your king. And be baptized in his name. How many of you have been baptized? Be baptized. What are you waiting for? You're not perfect enough? You'll be waiting a long time. I'm not kidding you. It's not about that. It's about obedience. It's about trust. Be baptized. We will help you. We will take you through the steps. Be baptized. So there's a census. The third part is fiducia. Fiducia means there must be a personal trust. Remember what James said. James said this, even the devil knows the Lord and he shudders. What does that mean? He's a better theologian than I'll ever be. You know why? He's got first-hand knowledge. He doesn't think. He knows about God, has seen him, has been in his presence. So what does that mean for me? If we have fiducia, we have a personal trust that ascends or submits to Jesus' claim. He, for me, is not only my Savior which means every time I'm tempted to trust in my own behavior for salvation, and I do that. I do it. I'm like, man, sometimes I'm like, man, you're really not growing enough. You're really not pure enough. And those are probably healthy thoughts, but sometimes they can reveal that I'm still trusting in myself a little too much. But he's also not only my Savior, he's my Lord. That means when God tells me something... I really got to trust that he's my Lord. And Lord doesn't mean someone with a whip that's whipping me. No, it means someone who's driving my ship with skill. Let me give you an example. I uh, have things that I constantly worry about. I know that's a sin. Does anybody else in this place have worries? I I love worrying. I'm great at it. I'm really good. Well, there was something that I was seeing, observing at a baseball game, and it was really causing me, as the Italians would say, agita. (laughs) The stomach was really upset because I felt that if this continued, one of my children would be hurt. And I don't know about you, when I think like that, you know what I do? I get in rehearsal mode. And I'll think about it and 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 think about it. And And I'll talk about it and I'll talk about it and I'll talk about it and it'll keep me up. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, when I went to my meeting on Friday, they talked about things that'll stick you in your progress in faith, okay? And one of the aspects is you're not turning your will and your care, the care of your life over the control of God. And I thought to myself, well, that doesn't apply to me. But it does apply to me. I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I have all this angst because I'm trying to control something I can't control. I've spoken the truth, I'm there, I'm available, but only God can really cause change to happen. So he's saying, Tom, are you going to bear the weight or are you going to hand it to me? In a baseball game, I said, okay, you hold it. And I felt lighter 
That's what it means to have personal faith. I have testimony. You have testimony where you have surrendered aspects over to your life. You have said, you know what, God? I know my flesh wanted to go in this way, but you, being with me and being someone who deeply loves me, you influence me to go this way. There must be that evidence in our life. So now we know what saving faith is and what it isn't. False shepherds have entered into the church as soon as the apostles planted the church. Strangely, now listen to this. This is crazy because this is a theological point. They are, false teachers and demons, are ordained by God in his salvific economy. That means he puts them there. Wait, what? Well, I'll explain to you. He puts them there, as I understand in scripture, as part of his salvific purpose. They are released to act as enemies of God and enemies for the stability of saints. Can I tell you something? Struggle is good for the human being. Too much pleasure, too much ease, not good for the human being. I'm going to tell you that right now. And God says, I have ordained to save my people to struggle. They will, by my power, my effort, my influence, struggle against the world, struggle against demonic influence, and struggle against their very own flesh. This is good for us. So he says, this is the first thing that I've released them to do. The second thing, it will show... God's, they will show God's skill in overcoming their determination to destroy God's church. Do you know what God will do? If you're determined to go in the wrong direction, he will intersect your plan and abort it. I've known of people who've decided to leave their family. They decided this is it. There's something else out there for me. I know that I could be more satisfied in this. And God literally comes in as they're racing toward this edge and kills it. Kills it. We have within us the Holy Spirit in verse uh, chapter 8, uh, right in about the middle, I think it's about the 14th chapter, where it says he prays for us with words that are inexpressible. He knows exactly what we need and he prays for us so that God would work miracles to stop us from harming ourselves or other people. So God demonstrates by these saboteurs, I can circumvent you. You think you're going this direction? All you're going to do is prove that I'm smarter than you by my overcoming you. Think about this. Satan himself thought that he could stop God's plan by killing Christ. And when he killed Christ, what happened? There was an earthquake, as we're told, which means that he, by trying to kill Christ, actually accomplished God's plan. Does that make sense? So these are things to give glory to God about. Here's another one. These false teachers will give God glory by him holding them over to righteous judgment. That means that the false teacher who refuses to repent will at some point be unable to repent. That means I'm going to hold you to a resistant, unrepented place until your very last breath. And then when you meet me, you will meet eternal damnation that many will never see. That's scary. That's scary. The third part is their mission has been given to them to shake free the chaff. That means there are many people year after year who receive Jesus Christ, but they've never received Jesus Christ. They receive some form of Jesus Christ, but not the Jesus Christ. These are usually people who um, want sel- they do not want the salvation that God offers them through Jesus, but they want the blessing of God. We have to make sure that our motives are good. One of the great things that the Holy Spirit does to us through grace is he allows us to e- examine our motives. You know, part of me wanted a church of 500. You know why I wanted a church of 500? Because I thought in my broken self, if I could make a church succeed to 500, then I wouldn't be a loser. Because my whole life I believed I was a loser. 
Do you see? It had nothing to do with God. It had to do with me. And God was like, no. I'm not going to give you that. It will only serve to kill your soul. You will see people as objects to meet your needs. That's not what I want. So you know what God did? He aborted my plan and he held me off like a perfect basketball player for 10 years until that dream in me died. I remember the exact place and time that it died. And I threw up my hands at Congress in Dearborn and I said, okay, whatever you want. You have the right. And surely enough, two years later, here I am on the mission field. All right? This is something to write down if you're writing stuff down. The responsibility to discern, to discern false shepherds fall squarely at the feet of the believer. I have everything I need to discern a false shepherd. If I do not read this with regularity, I'm in danger. I'm in danger. You could be lied to me week after week after week and never know it. Don't take my word for it. I hate when people say, well, my pastor said, well, listen to your pastor by all means, but check him. So I encourage you to become informed. Be informed. Constantly, we are exhorted to be on guard against spiritual con men and women. Listen to this. This is what Paul, speaking to Timothy, says. For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine and accurate instruction. That challenges the saints with God's truth. But wanting to have their ears tickled with something pleasing, they will accumulate for themselves many teachers, one after another, to satisfy their own desires and support the, support the errors that they are determined to hold. I love to encourage the saints, but if the encouragement doesn't come with a healthy portion of challenge, you will become fat, spiritually unfit. That's the truth. I know that there's a guy out there with a $24 million budget who says, my ministry is to encourage. Man, if there's not some challenge in that meal, they're becoming spiritually diabetic. Dangerous stuff. There's dangerous stuff in deception. This scripture tells me that it appears, listen, that God gives accessibility to the determined idolater to find counselors that will anchor down their unwillingness and determined heart to resist or deny God's authority. God knows our hearts. Man, he knows it. And you know what he wants us to do? To throw open our hands and go, you know me. You know what my first prayer is every day? Oh, Lord, you know that I am powerless to control my tendencies to do the wrong thing. In my flesh, I'm your enemy. I need you today. I need you today because I know who I am. That's what salvation is. If you don't have that what do you have? That's the first step that opens the door. The second part, the second prayer I pray and I encourage you to say is, Lord, I believe that I matter to you. You really care about me and you have the power to see me through. You have the power to heal me. Do you really believe God loves you and, and you matter to him? Don't just nod your head because I, I, don't, I, I don't think that many people do. I don't. I tell them it all the time. I'm like, I, I don't, sometimes I just don't feel like you, I feel like you have to love me, but you don't really love me. But he does. And then the third part is turning my conscious will over to the care of God on a regular basis. Man, I want my wife to change. Yeah, I love her to listen to me more and agree with me more. But she's like, I'm sorry, I can't compromise. But you know what? I have to trust God that sometimes I'm wrong and he's going to change me long before he changes her. That's the way it is.
right? Okay, first thing we need to do is we need to be discerning about who God, about the God, capital G, or the small g that's being taught. In the Secret Service, the counterfeit division agents are trained for a considerable time, not on the various types of counterfeits, but they are trained on what are the unchangeable marks of genuine currency. So if you want to know what the truth is, don't study or listen to people who have a ministry that are going to point out all the false teachers. Stick with the teachers that teach you the basic core truths and are unwaverable in it. Because if you have those core truths, man, I'm telling you, you're going to be able to spot it without any effort. You're going to smell it. You're like, man, I'm not getting caught up. I know that worship was really, really top notch. But man, what they're teaching from the front is just not true. Telling you, know the truth, know the truth. One of the things we want to do here is know the truth. I want to start up a class where we have, where we understand biblical theology. You know, where I where we go together and we wrestle through scripture. The men and the women, they all have that. The young adults, young adults don't just come out, hang out, and eat pizza in parking lots. They do that a lot. But they study the word of God. They wrestle with the word of God. The, the couples group, they do the same thing. All right, so. What is the first thing that we need to be aware of? Okay, how many minutes do I have? It's 7.05 right now. No, it's 12.54. All right. We have to be aware of distorted or characterized portraits of God. Show me the pictures of caricatures. Can you do it? All right. Now, you see, you've seen this before. <laughs> All right. Now, you can see there's elements of each and every one of these pictures that resembles the true picture. But we know that that is a cartoonized caricature of what the person actually looks like. Now show me the other portrait. This is a painting of Maggie Thatcher, which if you took a picture, a photographed picture of her and put it next to it, it would be identical. This is the way we must see God. This is the way a good shepherd will portray God in all of his fullness not caricaturizing who God is because a caricaturizing ver version of Christ is not a saving version of Christ. He's not. Many people, Jesus said it. Are there going to be many people in heaven? He goes, I tell you the truth, no. Many will come to me in the last day and they will go, hey, we know you. You ate in our homes. You preached in our streets. And he goes, I, I don't know who you are. You know, I did, I, I, I was in Sunday school. I was an elder. I was this, I was that. I expelled demons. And he's like, I, I don't know who you are. I don't know why you did what you did, but it wasn't for me because I don't know you. You got to know who Christ is. You got to know who God is. All right, let me explain this. The false teacher will accentuate the more attractive aspects of God. God reveals himself to be loving, merciful, and kind. We want to start with that. We must be strong in grace. God loves you. He loves you with a perfect love, not a passive love, not a codependent love. There are many people who love their children to the point of ruining them. Have you ever known that to happen? Ha <laughs> They love them to the point of ruining them. And can I tell you something? God will never be accused of being a codependent, <laughs> ever. He is merciful. That means he is really patient with me. He's kind to me. He's long-suffering. But I must also teach that he is just. He is holy. He is immutable. That means he is unchanging. He loves with commitments and perseverance but he will not excuse my behavior of resistance. I can tell you the truth. He shoots over the bow a lot in my life. Pew! Hey, pay attention. You're going in the wrong direction. Pew! Hey, you're not listening. And if I don't listen long enough, he'll hit me. Spoke with someone this weekend who said, man, you know the truth, you know the truth, oh, you know the truth, and that's why I respect you. I'm like, okay. And then he says, sometimes God puts us through trials, and I go, brother, if you test God enough, 
and you're his, he'll break your legs to get you where he wants you to be. I don't want us to be broken. That's not a joke. That's meant to scare you. Literally scare you. He, he will break your legs to get you where he wants to go. All right. Let's keep going back. Um, okay. So, um, I don't even know where this wind is killing me. All right. He is loving, holy. Uh, he is loving, merciful, and kind, but he is just holy and immutable. That means he loves us with commitment and perseverance, but he will not excuse. He will hold everyone accountable through consequence. And I'm going to tell you this right now. You don't want to be held to consequence because consequence can be a terrible, terrible outcome, especially if you're determined. You've anchored your ways in to a death path, a, a, a path that brings destruction. All right, let's keep moving on. He's patient, but he's not passive. He's gentle, but he's not weak. One of the aspects of God's beauty is his symmetry. There is no aspect of his personality that is ever out of proportion. God is above all things. Listen to this. This is most important. We've got about five more minutes, so stick with me. He is above all things holy. That's really hard to understand. I get it. It's hard to understand. You know why? Because the only definition is other. Other than what? Other than everything. So that's the best way you could describe God. Well, he's not the same as what? Everything else. So he's holy, and his holiness by nature is weighty. This means that his person has a huge implication on how I choose to live my life. My decisions matter because of his holiness. That's proper and full counsel of God. Because of his nature, his holy nature, he must, by whom he is, oppose anyone who rebels or resists against his authority. Anyone. He's like a perfect father to those who are the elect, but I know for a fact perfect fathers sometimes bring punishment or chastisement. Because he is holy, he is by definition universally the highest in worth. So it seems illogical to me for anyone who focuses on any teaching that implies God is the meaning to fulfilling my greatest desire through blessing. God saves us from that stuff. Listen to this. This is important. And we're just going to kind of, we're going to end at that because I've given you a lot of information. That means to me, I will stay away from anyone that focuses on blessing that is largely appealing to the masses. If my message is acceptable to tons of people, there might be a problem with it. Because the gospel message, by example, through the scripture in the gospel, is not acceptable to the masses. He drove away more than he attracted It's called man-centered teaching. Man-centered teaching will damn you. It will damn you. I think we're going to stop there because we're just going to stop there. I got next week and we're going to keep going. I want to encourage you with this one last thing. Um... This is kind of something that's really near and dear to my heart. You know why? Because I believe that there are many people who are deceived. There are many people who listen to people who are deceiving them. I don't want us to become a community of witch hunters. Because that spirit, that spirit that always is looking at people with a kind of a hairy eyeball, has a spirit that's attached to it. And that is the spirit of superiority. But because there are so many warnings in scriptures, we need to be informed as a church. And when you become educated and informed, you know what that does to me? It protects me. Because I can't trust me to keep myself where I should be. Nobody starts out. I think very few people start out and 
decide, well, I'm going to really just deceive thousands of people. Man, it just happens. If you become informed and you're informed and you're in tune with the Holy Spirit, you know what that does for me? It protects me. It protects our elders here because I need it. So this is a call to action, folks. Let's stand up. All my words fall short I've got nothing to do How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do Every song must end And you never So I throw up my hands and Praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a
my church. So I throw my hands and praise you again and again. It's all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. I know it's not much. I'm nothing else fit for a king. Am I on? All right, there we go. Let's hold hands because you know what? I'm going to tell you this right now. We, we are united with one another. And, and uh, it is my belief that it, it, it's not just my belief. It's what he said. He says, it is the love that the saints have for one another that will bear witness. And it will be an aroma for those whom God is taking out of the grave. So let's pray. Let's pray with urgency. Let's pray with fervency. And let's pray with faith. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Christ Jesus, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Father God, I just want to pray. I want to pray for everybody here. I want to pray for every home. Lord God, I know that homes and families are near and dear to your heart. I pray for the fathers. I pray that the fathers would find joy in their family. I pray that the fathers and the husbands would find their wives irresistibly attractive. And they would pursue them like they pursued them from the very beginning when they met them when they were 19 or 20 years old. I pray that the wives would find reason to forgive husbands and to trust husbands and su surrender to husbands. I pray for mothers and fathers to never see their children or the mundaneness of families as a burden, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, for your blessing, that it would cause a flowing of harmony in the house. I pray this, Lord God, so that you can exalt yourself within the church, you can bring order to the nation and peace through the world. And we pray this with one voice and one heart, in Jesus' name. And the saints said, Amen.